Today is July 13, 2016, and we are interviewing Norman Brown in Taylorville. Mr. Brown is 59 years old, having been born on May 12, 1957. My name is Sue Burkholder, and I will be the interviewer. Mr. Brown, would you please state for the recording in what branch of service you served? Served in the Marine Corps, United States Marine Corps. All right. Um, let's start with just some some early on background information, um, like where you were born and um, uh, who were your parents and like your siblings. And um, let's start with that. Oh, okay. I was born to <coughs> Mr. Willie Brown and Miss Lois Brown. Uh, I had four. So I'm the youngest of four siblings: uh, Willie Jr. and uh, James Gibson. Uh, and my sister Vanessa Brown and myself, uh, none of which were actually in the military except for myself. Um, going into the military was not really a popular choice uh, in my family, I believe. My, I can remember the look on my mother's face when I brought the recruiter home and uh, let her know that I was going into the military. Um, I originally had planned, uh, I went to the University of Wisconsin and Whitewater and after my first year I wasn't very happy with being there and I took a test for the Air Force that summer and uh, after much discussion we kind of decided I'd go back and try it for another year. Well in the interim of that year I ran into a friend of mine up in the uh, University of Wisconsin Madison named uh, Anthony Elliott and he the football player up there and we became real good friends and kind of decided that he'd had enough of playing football and I'd had, we both had enough of University of Wisconsin. We decided to go into the buddy program in the Marine Corps. So we were both born in May, so we were going to have a going away party and after the party we were going to uh, go off into the buddy plan and be Marines. Well, Marine Corps didn't quite see it that way, although initially they went along with us and promised that we would be on the buddy program, we would enter into the service together, we would go through boot camp together as the uh, program supposed, supposedly goes. But uh, I believe at the last minute uh, that came, I was in the, uh, I was with my, son, with my sister at the time, uh, the guys came to the apartment and that told me that I had to go into the Marines now that I had signed the contract and that it was time for me to be inducted, which made me very unhappy, uh, especially when I got to San Diego and I was in a little room here with just a bunch of strange guys and no friend. Um, so as I was going through basic training about uh, Midway, I did actually see Tony in, in the Corps, and he was just about as angry with the Marines as I was. And we had both at that point talked about um, not completing our tour. Um, as uh, before, told me when we uh, finished basic training, rather than to try to go AWOL, that uh, we just would, you know, not go go through with uh, with our enlistment. So. Um, I did. I, I went on and completed my contract. Uh, unfortunately, I happened to uh, lost contact with my friend. I hated that that happened. Um, I, to this day, I couldn't tell uh, what happened. It's been some 34, 35 years or better, and I've lost contact with them. Uh, but I went on to complete my obligation with the Marine Corps, even though I was very disappointed that they didn't hold up their end of the bargain. Um, my first duty station out of boot camp was to uh, return back to San Diego where I completed basic training and uh, go through what was called infantry school. I was told that uh, not only would I have to go through the infantry, when I signed up for uh, to take a trade, the uh, electrical trade, which was also guaranteed in my contract that I would be in the infantry, uh, said that my test scores didn't quite meet up 
with what they had promised me. Well, it was strange that that happened because at the time I signed up, they were good enough for me to, to be able to be promised this as it was to be into the buddy program. So um, continually to go down this slippery slope of, uh, you know, being made these, you know, playing one hand against, you know, slide of hand type of games with the military. And um, I was very disappointed. Uh, and as I talked to my fellow Marines, I noticed that it was not just I that was being dealt this hand. Uh, it was almost a common practice that they were actually doing this to not necessarily myself, but many, many other people. And I don't believe that really, you know, helped with the uh, morale of the uh, troops. Uh, so much during my basic training, I uh, believe a lot of guys saw that movie Full Metal Jacket where uh, one of the uh, personnel uh, Marines that was uh, on the small fire line uh, actually took a a rifle and put it up under his chin and shot himself. Well, that actually happened the first time that we went to live fire. And uh, I happened to be about five rows to the side and about two rows back, uh, being ready to shoot that day, which when that incident happened, everything was called off, so I didn't shoot until the next day. So I actually saw that live and it was a very traumatic incident, but uh, I said I completed the basic training. I did qualify with my weapon. I believe I qualified uh, marksman the first time, and I believe I did a little better the second time. I sharpshooted, but I was never an expert with the with the gun because I hadn't had any previous experience uh, firing a uh, firing any type of weapon rifle or anything. I've never been hunting or fishing or anything like that. I basically uh, ran track and, you know, basically did activity swam and just a lot of the little things the kids did growing up. Uh, so, after completing infantry school, coming back and completing infantry school in uh, San Diego, well, actually in Camp Pendleton, I came back and went through what was called C school where they train you to go aboard a ship, uh, small ship, large ships, whatever, and train you to see what life is going to be like during going to sea. One of the big pitfalls that I recall that we trained, and it was very, it was kind of a standout type of thing, was that fires happen out there at sea. Ships burn up. Uh, you have to learn how to put out fires. So we went through uh, fire safety and fire training courses uh, to, you know, learn how to survive at sea. And we completed that. And I was off to uh, an aircraft carrier, the uh, USS America, out of uh, Norfolk, Virginia, uh, chosen to go to the East Coast. Um, it was it was a very uh, very very nice experience. Uh, perhaps I should have went to do my bidding like some of the other guys in my unit uh, that somewhat chose this ship. I was pretty much chose for my ship. I happened to uh, be able I happened to go on a pass that day to the BX when they were choosing, and I came back and I was assigned the ship. Well. When I returned, when I uh, reached Norfolk, excuse me, one second. When I got to Norfolk, my ship was being in repair, and I just got finished spending some time with my mom, who was basically she uh, she was a janitor at the uh, University of Roosevelt University of Chicago. And it was her dream that all her children would go to college and everything. So she wasn't very happy with, with me going to the military uh, and giving up on college. But I, but I was hoping that she would understand. So I went out, and my, no, I didn't know that my ship was 
and repair. So I spent quite a bit of time in the barracks waiting to go to my ship. Well, during the time that I was in the military, I hadn't really had very much contact with my family, uh, neither my siblings nor much of my parents. So I was kind of like a little homesick and isolated at the time too. But uh, I ended up going to my ship after sitting in the barracks for I'd say maybe a couple of months. And going aboard an aircraft carrier was a very uh, eye-opening experience. I was, wow, it was one of the biggest ship I'd ever seen in my life. Uh, it seemed like going down the docks to the ship seemed like you walk forever um, then you walk aboard the ship and there were customs and courtesies that you had to do as far as boarding ships uh, there were naval traditions that had to be honored uh, as far as uh, greetings and saluting the flag and all that to come aboard the ship and ask for permission um, we would come up and salute the flag and asked permission to board the ship, and it was very, very, uh, very nice. Well, after coming aboard and going to the Marine Detachment uh, where I was to be staying, I found that to be a, a very close, <laughs> being about six foot four, I found that to be very close and uh, personal to be on board with that many people confined in that small a space. But I enjoyed the people that I was uh, assigned to be on the ship with. Unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> weight with a lot of just basically the way the military operates, uh, having to hurry up and wait, I was not necessarily assigned to duty right away. And not being assigned to duty and just having a lot of time on your hands just really didn't play into to my life so uh, right around I got there I'd say right around the holiday time so during the holidays I didn't have very much to do as far as obligations to the ship so finally did get uh, called home to let my parents let my mom know at this time she was um, they were, my parents were somewhat separated so I was calling to just kind of do a check to see how she was getting along and she told me that uh, she was a little down in spirits and asked how I was doing so <clears throat> she says hey you know if you're not doing anything can you uh, can you make it back here for for the holiday I didn't think much of it I really hadn't had an assignment I decided to take her up on her offer and she uh, sent a plane ticket for me to come back and I spent I believe like uh, I think three days about three days I came back it's over the weekend and a couple of days during the week when I wasn't assigned any duty I took and went to uh, stay with my mom for holidays and see that she was doing okay she had uh, you know with her she had arthritis problem and she was up in age because we were pretty much late children I think uh, about this time my mom was about 59 or 60 and I was about 19 or 20. So when I returned to the ship, I got in trouble for it. And eventually that trouble led to me being dismissed from being on uh, sea duty. So that really set, set me back a ways also uh, because seemed like every time I was promised to start doing anything in the Marine Corps, these guys were pulling everything back. At that time, I decided to myself to not necessarily uh, just leave, which was my first impression. Just, you know, my first impression was to say, how the hell with this? And, uh, just basically leave and not, not even come back. Uh, I was sent to uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina which was, <clears throat> I was sent to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, which was the nearest, uh, ba nearest camp, which was on the East Coast. I got there and um, it was a beautiful place, uh, right off the ocean, off the Pacific Ocean. 
uh, midways between, I guess, midways of the East Coast. Very beautiful, uh, a lot of Southern charm, everything. Um, I sat there after I went through receiving again. I had to go through receiving to come into the bases. Most places do when you initially come to anywhere, you you have to be orientated in, and when you come out, you have to be orientated out. So well, briefed in and briefed out. So I, um, I I was assigned to the Fifth Marines, I believe the Third Fifth Battalion Third Marines, which were the Hillsmen. They were the they were a very decorated unit. They were the French Forze because they were in the battle with the French. <clears throat> they were in the battle with the French and they were very highly decorated because of the combat and the action that they did. I remember quite vividly, I thought that, uh, for lack of a greater word, I thought that my first sergeant was a redneck because, I mean, he seemed like this guy got down on everybody. But I got to, well, we had a little run in, and I got to know the guy, and I found out he was a straight shooter. If you shot straight with him, he shot straight with you. And he got down on me about being a sea duty and told me I didn't deserve my dress blues. And I told him, hey, I went through the training, I earned every bit of it. And uh, as far as I was concerned, they were mine. And actually, him being stand up, myself being stand up, uh, we got along quite well. And at that time, I just decided I didn't want to be stuck with two years left in the military and just being bogged down and disappointed and not necessarily receiving the things that I was promised. So I figured to make the best way to make my time go by was to travel. At that, <clears throat> so the good thing about being in Camp of the June, a lot of different orders come down where Marines are in demand uh, all the time and I just missed a Mediterranean um, troop, a Mediterranean uh, detachment going out to the Mediterranean out of Camp Lejeune and then I got next earshot that there would be one going to uh, a Westpac, which would be going out to uh, Japan and um, the Philippines and the Orient. So I decided that I would go ahead and um, sign up for that, which was in my favor. I received it. I did hate that I had to leave the uh, North, leave North Carolina because I was just kind of being there and I was somewhat liking it. Uh, but I decided to go out to Japan and when I got there, it was nothing like I thought it would be. It wasn't like I would be cruising or going anywhere. I was basically on, on an island. We called the island The Rock for those in the Marine Corps. There's probably a lot of rocks in the military, as I found out uh, later, that uh, in my experience being in the military. But uh, basically, we were stationed on the island, and I stayed there for a number of months. And the grease hot year round uh, when it's not raining. It rains something called a monsoon. Uh, similar to a hurricane where you have high winds and high rain and basically you, you just don't go anywhere. Uh, you pretty much are confined and uh, when it's not raining it's hot. I mean somewhere is an upwards between 95 and 110 degrees uh, midday between the hours of 2 to 4 in the middle of the day. Uh, at that time, usually most training is stopped. Uh, they call what they call a black flag goes up. So we train usually early in the daytime until the black flag goes up and then there basically there's no training. And, but there was free movement about the camp. Um, 
I was somewhere, I was stationed midway in between the island. So I could basically go down to the main part, the, the city part of the land down there by the Air Force Base. Uh, the island was set up in a very unique way. As I found out, most government installations are, uh, where Navy, of course, is, would be by the sea, the Air Force would be uh, somewhere close around town or somewhat in a uh, general vicinity of where the population, around where population could get to, <clears throat> whereas the Army and the Air Force would be basically pretty much detached from society. They basically would be more out towards the um, the the jungle or the jungle in in Japan or the outskirts is in North Carolina somewhat in the outskirts as in Camp Pendleton also they were, they were kind of on the outskirts um, in the same way as in California the Air Force was stationed around the population of San Bernardino and, and the Navy is stationed right down by San Diego and of course the Marines and the Army there out towards the outskirts so it seemed to be pretty much that all around all around the world I guess my world my military world so when I you, excuse me I was gonna ask you when you were in Okinawa um, what besides your training and your actual duties what else did you do there like in your free time in my free time there was a in my free time basically there was uh, not there was not a lot to do in Okinawa uh, outside of uh, outside the gates there you go to there was a town mm -hmm. uh, by self I was in Camp Hansen so there was a town right outside Camp Hansen that you could go to to the bars and you could actually socialize with the people of Japan or you could basically stay on post or on the uh, on base and go to the enlisted man's club if you're enlisted and uh, basically drink and commiserate with the with your comrades or basically go we had gym facilities where you could work out so that was more of my thing I wasn't I never really have been much of a person that really has a I don't know how do you say that um, Alcohol is not friendly to me. <laughs> I'm not necessarily friendly to it, uh, so I don't really care to, to uh, end up being intoxicated and having to deal with the repercussions of a hangover and all of the losses that go along with it. So I would go to the gym, um, go to the club every now and then, eat a pizza or something. I go outside the base sometimes to uh, get some of the uh, specialties they have different meals that I like with uh, the rice meals, shrimp fried rice and other different uh, Japanese meals that uh, frog legs or some of the seafood delicacies that they have uh, because the Japanese are good fishermen so you'd have all type of different seafood and a lot of it had to do with rice. Uh, once in a while I would go down to the Air Force Base um, tour on the weekends and I'd go down there just to kind of stretch my legs and just get a different uh, group of scenery after looking at the same thing for like about two or three months it gets kind of old so I'd go down there to take a, take in different sites I don't ever recall going to a movie theater or, or a dance or anything like that um, and the good part about it, I didn't, I was only over there for, it was a one year duty station. I only had to be over there for about three quarters of that. So I was somewhat glad of that. And during the time I was there, we did catch a uh, tour, which took us to different other islands like uh, the Philippines, uh, Hong Kong. Some of the detachment went down to Australia. 
to maybe um, believe we went to Thailand, but we, we got to see a little bit of the scene and we got to travel a little bit while I was over there in the nine months I was there. Did you, were there any, or what would you say were one or two interesting things that you saw while you were um, on your tour or in that area? What would you call the most interesting things that you saw? At that time, things were, it was kind of hot and cold. I really wouldn't say it was really anything very interesting. Um, uh, my frame of mind was that I was doing time. Uh, I wasn't, uh, I had good relationships with my peers, with uh, my comrades, and basically the things that we did um, was were the things that I was involved with. Uh, I'd go over to the gym and work out and just kind of pass time. And I'd go to the club with, with the guys, you know, basically to pass time, eat a few pizzas, have a couple of, you know, have a beer or, or some soft drinks or whatever. And basically come back and um, somewhat uh, just do things that we did, play cards and sit around and um, talk, magazines, everything. Yeah, I remember back in in the 70s or 80s, we didn't have internet like the kids have now. Mm -hmm. So it really wasn't, we really weren't, uh, we were more of an active kind of uh, type of uh, type of people. We didn't have the video games and, and all that stuff. So we, we basically were kind of active, hands on, playing basketball, going to the gym, lifting weights, uh, things of that nature. Probably the most dramatic thing I saw was I saw one guy who was so physically fit. I mean, it looked like this guy was a uh, gymnast. The way he could just, you know, just make his body just, you know, he was so incredibly strong. Um, I was fascinated by that. Some of, some of the things my peers could do, they were, and their talents. Um, some were artists. Some were physically, they were just gifted people. Um, did you make any friendships that during your time in the service that have lasted outside of that time? Mm, <clears throat> I've made a few, but uh, they they haven't been any uh, anything really. Last, I've made a uh, lasting, uh, kind of got detached from from some of them. Uh, basically, we kind of everybody kind of went their own separate ways. Uh, during the time when I was ready to get out, I didn't stay but one tour. Um, we all kind of came in at one time and left out at another. We came in at, at one time and everybody kind of left. Uh, when their time was up unless they decided to re-enlist. Uh, I had a real interest in re-enlistment uh, that I never took. So uh, that kind of kept me from being in touch with some of the guys. And, uh, Do you, um, can you recall or, or what are some life lessons that you learned from your time in the military that you feel like you've been able to carry on into your the rest of your life. Get it in writing. Someone promises you something. Make sure that you uh, you do your homework and you uh, you get it in writing. Don't don't you know? I guess the trust factor was pretty much destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just uh, you, you just can't trust people because people are people. Very careful. Well, when um, so, where were you then when you were ready to leave the military? How did that come about? When I was uh, when I got ready to leave the military, I was in Camp Horno in California, out in Camp Pendleton. The uh, unit that I was in in Okinawa was. Their name was the Walking Dead. You probably may have heard from them. They were on uh, the 1st Battalion, 9th Marine. Uh, during the Vietnam era war, uh, they were a unit that 
got slaughtered. Uh, they did some things and the uh, Vietcong took offense to it and uh, they ran them down and they killed them. Well, they were not allowed to go back to the United States uh, at that time. So in 80, 1980, when after I joined them, they wrote to, they, they started to call it a rotation instead of just calling up different Marines and having them volunteer, it was a rotation that was started. And I was part of that rotation that rotated back to uh, the 3rd Battalion. Uh, and the 3rd Battalion came to Okinawa. And I was in California at that time with the, uh, on the base of the 3rd Battalion with the uh, 9th Battalion. And I don't know how it's done today, but it was at the beginning of the uh, rotation, which rotated the uh, the colors of that particular branch back to to the uh, to the United States. It's kind of like bringing our fallen soldiers back home. So your military service is coming to an end. Um, um, when you were discharged, then where did you go, and what did you do? <laughs> I had a very interesting discharge. Um, after rotating back to the United States, um, I decided to take a bribe. <laughs> decided to marry uh, one of the girls from University of Wisconsin, and. Uh, when we got married, she did not move out to California, which I should have it should have put something in my head about that time. Well, off into the marriage, about uh, say seven, we were married for a very brief time. Um, when I was getting ready to come home, she had filed for divorce papers, and my mother was telling me how sick she was still was, and so I was caught between reenlisting. Uh, and coming home. I had, during some of the time while I was overseas, I, I brought my test scores up. I had got some uh, educational books in between working out. I, I'd study and I convinced the Marine Corps to allow me to retest, which I did. I scored high enough and I was offered the opportunity to go to uh, helicopter mechanic school, electrical mechanic school. And at that time, I hadn't been promoted. And I'd been looked over for quite a few promotions. And I was a little ill about that. And then, so I had so many irons in the fire at this time. And then I had this woman saying, we're going to be divorced when you get home. And, you know, I was So the long and the short of it was that uh, about the time I was ready to be discharged, I uh, so I went back. I got ready to to go, and it we had been back and forth about it. I was I wasn't going to get the promotion that I'd asked for. I would get a promotion for me enlisting, but the promotion that I deserved, I felt that I was going to get that wasn't going to happen. Uh, I would be able to go to uh, 29 Palms to uh, to start school if I re-enlisted. I forget exactly what what time they were asking for. I would not get a bonus for re-enlisting, which was very popular at the time. For uh, guys uh, staying with the military, would get a bonus. So the package really wasn't that great. I didn't feel like I was being valued and I decided to elect to go home. I let them know in ample time that, you know, look, if, you, if you're not going to, if you're not going to make this worth my while, I'm, I'm going to leave. Uh, a few, a couple, two of the guys that I'd served with uh, on the East Coast in my first duty station would stay, happened to be stationed at the uh, base at the time. And one was taking leave, and we were supposed to drive back to Chicago. 
we were going to hit one station in California with us. And that was really nice because it made me feel better because I really wanted to go back to North Carolina from Japan. But a couple of guys that I was stationed on the uh, aircraft carrier with were assigned there. And uh, one went to the drill, went to the drill field. Well, both of them went to the drill field after, because uh, they were they were reenlisting, and I was gonna reenlist, but we were both gonna drive back because he had a 30-day pass, and and I was kind of deciding what I was gonna do. My date of discharge came, and <clears throat> the guys, everybody's ready. I'm packed up. They're packed up. You know, we were like, man, we sorry you're not going to stay and everything. So uh, the Marine Corps decided that they didn't want to pay me. It was a Friday, and um, it was the 27th day of, of April. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute. This is it. The clock has run out. You guys have to pay me. And it just happened to be uh, the time for everybody to get paid anyway because I believe the weekend or something's coming around the 30th and I wasn't paid so and not only was I not paid my uh, discharge papers weren't even ready so I was now I'm furious these guys have made me come in when I'm not supposed to it's time for me to leave and they still don't have the act together and I've made all these promises that now they're trying to mess me up on and trying to make me the same way they are. They're reneging on all their promises and they're putting me in a situation to have to renege on all my promises. So I was, I was very, very upset. And uh, it was about 20, 20, I was in my early 20s, so I had plenty of energy to be upset about it at that time too. And so I went down there and they still never got my discharge papers ready, but they 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 felt better for me to, to go ahead and pay me, which was probably a good thing because I believe at that time I would have probably ended up in the brig. I'm sure I would have tore up some equipment because I was just I was just really upset. So I was paid and at that time I I um, the guy had to we were on a time schedule. I'd missed my ride going back to Chicago, and I ended up having to catch, uh, I ended up getting the boy, the Greyhound bus to go home. I just didn't even want to stay. Uh, I just took, I had some guy pay some of my other friends to just drop me off at the Greyhound, and I just boarded a bus. I didn't take a plane. I just figured I'd take some time. So about a week later, I, I arrived back to Chicago. And when I arrived back to Chicago, uh, my ex did exactly what she said she was going to do. My box, my clothes and everything was sitting right there at the door for me when I got there. And uh, she was like, oh, here's the papers and I'll see you later. So uh, at that time, one of the sweetest mother-in-laws in the world. And uh, she wasn't happy. She was like, no, the boy did everything he was supposed to be doing, and he does not have to leave here. We were in a three, uh, it was a three, uh, it was an apartment building that we stayed in. My grand, it was my mother-in-law's building, and she was bedridden at the time. So it was one of the reasons why I allowed my wife to stay in Chicago, because she needed, she told me that she was trying to help with her grandmother because her grandmother was bedridden and she stayed with her sister who had been with her for a long time. So she said that she was helping them. And my, my mother-in-law was not having it one bit. And uh, so I didn't stay upstairs with my wife. I came downstairs to my mother-in-law's and she says, well, I don't have anything but a couch, but this is your house like it is hers and I don't like what she's doing one bit and you don't go nowhere, you stay right there. And I stayed on the couch, I think, for like about a week or two. And eventually I just, you know, I, I was, I got a little disappointed. I just went on, I had my mother was, had a house around and she was complaining. She was, at this time, um, 
she was with my father was still separated. So I went back over there to see how she was doing and she just convinced me to stay a couple of nights and one night led into a week and a month and I ended up being back with my mom. So that's pretty much how my discharge went. And uh, eventually uh, in the mail, I received my, my discharge papers. <laughs> well, is there any last thing that you would like to say to anybody who might uh, view your interview or uh, future generations about military service? Well, yes, there is. There's uh, something I would definitely say about uh, someone that is thinking about going into the military, and that is basically to do your homework before going in. And basically, the military is more of a career move. I don't believe that anybody should go into the military um, for just... Um, a couple of tours. I believe that if you're going to go in, go in and retire because that's where the real benefits are. Um, my disappointment with the military was that I didn't go in and stay active duty for the full amount and get a retirement out of it. Uh, I believe that I had a lot to offer them and I believe that they had a lot to offer me. The sad part of it is that we never actually got on the same plane where we could basically benefit from each other and uh, I believe that was a big loss for myself and uh, my country. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Brown, for your time doing this interview and thank you for your service to our country. You're welcome. Thank you, ladies. Mm -hmm.